Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jenny Robb, and I'm the head curator of comics and cartoon art here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, which is part of the Ohio State University Libraries. All in one breath. So I welcome everybody. Um, this is our last program here um, at Billy Ireland of the day. Uh, right after this is over, there's the women's comics panel, which is over at the Wexner Center. So it's just across the way. You should have time if you leave right away to get over there after this. But then come right back here for our um, opening reception, which will be from 5 to 7. Um, check out the exhibits if you haven't seen them. Our open house, which is right below us. Uh, we'll have a, a special award ceremony. Um, you don't want to miss it. And then just after that, we'll be back over at the Wexner Center for Keith Knight's presentation. Uh, and then if you would like to join us um, for the uh, after party, uh, that will be taking place after uh, Keith's presentation. So that's the rest of the day. And then please remember that uh, the galleries will be open tomorrow and Sunday. Uh, you're welcome to come back and see the exhibits, but everything else is going to be taking place downtown at the Columbus Metro Library and the Columbus College of Art and Design and the uh, Columbus Museum of Art. Uh, so with that, uh, we are here to celebrate a, a special occasion. Um, Charles M. Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, was born on November 26, 20, uh, sorry, 1922. <laughs> so that makes this the centennial of his birth. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to partner with the Charles M. Schultz Museum and Research Center to produce the exhibit that we have um, in our galleries. How many people have seen that exhibit so far? Already? All right, fantastic. Uh, so we are very grateful to Lucy Shelton Caswell, who couldn't be here with us today um, uh, for curating that show for us. Um, she's our, our founding curator and one of the founding um, uh, founders of the Cartoon Crossroads Columbus as well. And I do want to point out we have another special guest who was a, a lender to our exhibit, and that's Rosemary McDaniel, who's right there. She can just wave. <laughs> and also a longtime volunteer at the Schultz Museum. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. OK. So we're thrilled today to have Paige Braddock with us here, who's going to be talking to us about uh, Sparky, um, celebrating Sparky, cultivating the legacy of Charles M. Schultz. Paige is an Eisner-nominated artist and writer and the chief creative officer at Charles M. Schultz Creative Associates. She's illustrated several Peanuts children's books. Her other graphic novels for children include the series Peanut Butter and Crackers and Stinky Cecil. Her Eisner-nominated comic strip Jean's World was the first gay-themed comic work to receive online distribution by a national media syndicate in the US. Braddock concluded the comic strip after completing its 20-year run in 2018. So please join me in welcoming Paige. Thank you. That was a very generous introduction. Um, hello, everybody. I'm a little nervous. Uh, there's nothing worse than talking about comics in front of a, you know, a room full of cartoonists and experts. So <laughs> just bear with me. Um, we are celebrating Sparky's 100th. Uh, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, just my experience with Sparky and then lead into talking about his work directly. Um, a lot of people confuse the studio with the museum and I run the studio which is down the street from the museum and as you can see from this photo looks a little like a dentist office from the 1970s. Um, in 1999 Schultz asked me if I'd come work at his studio in California. There were no other cartoonists working there at the time. Now we have a team of 26. Um, Sparky was looking for someone who could illustrate Peanuts books and in general help with licensing art needs. I had been working as an illustrator for newspapers for about 12 years, so working in a small studio with one of the greatest cartoonists of all time, who also happened to be my hero, was a little bit intimidating. Um, I didn't really know what to expect, but Schultz was surprisingly easy to work with. Obviously, he was a master of his craft at this point, so he gave confident and strong feedback as I learned how to work with his art for licensees and publishers. He was also very approachable and patient and generous. One weekend after I first started working at the studio, um, he handed me this red sketchbook. He said he thought I might like to take it home over the weekend and look at it. 
And I quickly realized that this is the sketchbook I'd heard about and seen photos of, the sketchbook that he'd taken with him to Europe during his time in the service. And of course, I was a nervous wreck the entire weekend, afraid I was gonna spill coffee on it. I don't even, I'm not even sure I picked it up off the coffee table. I just kind of set it there and then just like <laughs> looked at it all weekend. Um, I'm not a comic scholar. And uh, as I said, I don't work for the museum. Like many of you, I am a cartoonist. And for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about Sparky as a cartoonist. And whenever possible, I'm going to use direct quotes from him. I'll allow Sparky to talk about his own work in his own words. Unlike my own drawing board, Sparky's desk was always completely uncluttered and consistently at about a 30 degree angle. This photo was taken uh, by a photographer named Jeff Spears who came to Sparky's office right after he passed away and took a lot of photos of the space before it was changed and moved to the museum. So this is the first quote from Sparky. The comic strip can be an extremely creative form of endeavor. On its highest level, we find a wonderful combination of writing and drawing, generally done by one man sitting at a drawing board in a room all by himself, much the same as a composer sitting at a piano or a writer crouched over his typewriter. When I give talks about Sparky's work, I always mention uh, what a game changer he was. Seeing his strip amongst the other comics in this area, you really see what I mean. His comic style is so different, so modern, even in this daily from 1951. So much of the panel is left open, giving his drawings room to breathe. In this strip, there's, in this strip, there's a simple visual gag between Snoopy and a bird who's not quite Woodstock yet. It wouldn't be until 1954 when Peanuts became the comic strip we know today. This is our first glimpse of the unrequited wants and desires that would populate Peanuts comics moving forward. No one was writing about this in quite the way Sparky was at the time. Most of his peers were doing gag comics or adventure strips. This particular comic from 54 is one of my favorites. It's pretty darn perfect. Let's talk for a minute, about, a minute about Sparky's tools. Many cartoonists and fans know of his famous pen nib, but some of you may not know what led to his discovery of this particular nib. I have a marvelous pen point. I'm the only person drawing that uses this particular pen point, and it was by sheer accident. When I worked at art instruction schools, we used to sign the diploma when the students graduated. They gave us these points that were really the kind you might find in a bank. They were dip pens, and I started drawing with mine, and I discovered that it was a very strong point that could make a nice fine line when held in one direction, but also could hold and stand the pressure of making a very broad line without the pen point being too flexible. I found that drawing with a pen and ink to be extremely challenging as well as gratifying. I feel that it is possible to achieve something near to what fine artists call paint quality when working with the pen. I try to do as little pencil sketching as possible as I prefer to work directly with pen and ink. The pencil stage involves the blocking of the characters. Eventually, I get to the point where I can start inking the characters and I have to do it myself. I can't have someone else ink them because this is really the art of the whole thing. Getting the expressions just the way you want them. And I'm never quite sure just exactly what the expression will be until it comes right out the end of the pinpoint. Sparky would sometimes do very small loose sketches on a legal pad that he kept by his desk when he was working out his ideas which he would then crumple and toss into the trash. Uh, most nights, his secretary at the time, Edna, would go in after he left his office and retrieve the discarded drawings. <laughs> there was quite a while where she was driving around with all this crumpled up paper in the trunk of her car. I just thought that was really funny. This is a photo, again by Jeff Spears, of Sparky's pen tray just as he left it. And this is a quote about his tools. My equipment is extremely simple. About all I need is four or five pens and a pencil. I use a soft pencil and about three types of pens. I use a C5 speedball pen for lettering. 
The speedball pen comes in handy when I want Lucy to yell. Sparky was once asked which characters were his favorites. Linus, Charlie Brown, and Snoopy. And, and I like Lucy because of the fact that she provides me with so many ideas, but I don't necessarily approve of her personality. <laughs> but I really like Linus and Charlie Brown. Snoopy's kind of, a, kind of frightening because he's so uncontrollable, and he's a little selfish, too. I mean, he really isn't all he claims to be. He thinks he's so independent. He has all these illusions of grandeur, and he treats Charlie Brown so miserably, when actually Snoopy is completely dependent on Charlie Brown but he, he pretends he isn't. One of the strengths of Peanuts is Schultz's character development. It was something I wanted to ask him about, but he always talked about the characters as if he had no control over them. Um, shortly after I started working in the studio, I asked him one day why uh, Marcy calls Peppermint Patty Sir, and he said, I have no idea. She's very strange. <laughs> Some of my favorite quotes are when Sparky talks specifically about the craft of drawing. I purposely tilt the pen in a certain way so that as the lines that make up the boards in the doghouse go across, a little bit of ink drops below the line, which simulates the feeling of wood on the doghouse. Now, you have to know what you're doing with that. If you took a ruler and drew it, the doghouse would turn into a refrigerator. And I'm, and I'm proud of that line. But that's lost in newspaper reproduction. It just becomes a line, but I still have to for my own sake and for the sake of other craftsmen who will see it someday and maybe appreciate it. This next quote is from a speech that Schultz gave to a group of cartoonists during his keynote address at the National Cartoonist Society Convention in 1998. There may be people in the room that were there um, there were probably 500 cartoonists in the room. I remember some people were even standing in the back. And we were all hanging on every word because we all considered Sparky a true master, a true artist. He said, I'm still searching for that wonderful pen line that comes down when I'm drawing Linus. You start with the pen up near the back of his neck and you bring it down and, and bring it out and the pen point fans just a little bit and you draw the lines for the marks of his sweater. This is what it's all about, to get feeling of depth and roundness, and the pin line is the best pin line you can make. That's what it's all about. Snoopy's appearance and personality have changed probably more than any of those of any of the other characters. As my drawing style loosened, Snoopy was able to do more things, and when I finally developed the formula of him using his imagination to dream of being many heroic figures, the strip took on a completely new dimension. I think that any humor which is really worthwhile is humor which comments upon some aspect of life. That's what I'm trying to do most of the time. Although there are certain times in the drawing of comics that you do not necessarily have to make a strong social statement. You can make a drawing which in itself is simply a funny little drawing. The thing which you must try to do is to develop a change of pace so that your ideas are not too heavily weighted along certain lines. I like to have a simple idea one day and then go for something profound the next. Other than Charlie Brown symbolizing some of the faults we all have, I don't know what any of the characters symbolize. This never enters my mind. Characters in a comic strip work two ways. They provide ideas by the nature of their personalities, and then carry out roles and ideas I demand for them to play. Not only was Peanuts an amazing comic strip, but Schultz was groundbreaking in terms of licensed product based on those characters. It's good to remember that all the Peanuts things we see out in the world started at a small wooden drawing board as the creative vision of one man. Schultz created 17,897 comic strips in all, making Peanuts arguably one of the longest running illustrated stories ever told by one human being. And it's maybe the stories of these characters even more than their visual appeal that have made us all fall in love with them. 
a love that is perhaps a bit deeper than simple fandom. We are inspired and entertained by the way that Snoopy, and especially Gifted Beagle, allows us to join in his imagined adventures. We love Charlie Brown because regardless of his endless failures with kites and girls and baseball, he never gives up. And we love the ever contemplative Linus, despite his insecurities, we are drawn to him because he is ever hopeful of the intrinsic goodness of humankind. Thank you. I know there were some of you that probably panicked when you saw how many pages I had in my hand, but <laughs> I printed it really big so that I could read it. Great. So we have time for question and yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll sit here. I'll let you stay up the podium. God, that was it was even less than I thought. I guess 30 it was minutes, quick. but yeah. yeah, sorry. I always feel like people lose attention after 30 minutes anyway, so <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, my biggest job right now is um, as executive producer of the new animated content that's on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, I am not an animator, so this has been a challenge for me. Uh, but we have a really great team in Vancouver we work with. And then um, anytime I get a chance to ink a story, like for Boom Comics or any of the like uh, Simon & Schuster stuff we do, I usually... I usually try to do that also so that I don't forget how to draw in the meantime. <laughs> yes. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're right, it's super personal, right? And when he, he draws, he doesn't, he, he did pencil much. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, just organic life to the pen line that you, if you're trying to mimic that, is really hard to imitate because a lot of it for him is just muscle memory, right? I know Charlie Brown's head. Well, if I make his head too round, it's suddenly totally off model, right? It's not, it's not a complete circle. Um, it was funny. He would, um, I would draw something and he would say that didn't look right. And then he would <laughs> lean over my shoulder, you know, and, and show me how to draw it. But one of the funniest things I remember was that you know, most uh, cartoon characters, if they're drawn by more than one person or if they're animation, like all the fingers are the same uniform size or all the feet or whatever, and he would say, all your fingers are different. So it, like even on Snoopy or Charlie Brown, anybody, all the fingers were unique. And I was like, oh, okay, that's the first tip to like really notice that. Um, but literally every day I would drive, I, I had been working in journalism for 12 years, had come from Atlanta which is, you know, really super urban downtown, gritty, where the newsroom office was. And I would pull into the studio parking lot and I go, this can't be real. It's so weird. And then you go in the studio and it's so quiet. After working, you know, with 600 people in a newsroom, it's just like... Um, the funny thing about Schultz was, though, is, is that he, um, he loved to talk about theology. And uh, he would occasionally show up on my door with a slice of apple pie or a donut or whatever and say, let's take a break. And we'd go sit in the conference room and we'd talk about something like theology or something else. Um, I don't know. That's I'm amazing. rambling now, sorry. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yes. Sorry. There's somebody behind the pole right there. That is our total mission statement. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, what is the studio's role in sort of uh, all the new content that gets created? And uh, if, whether it's books or animation or even a caption on a t-shirt, the studio's mission statement is to adhere to the integrity of Schultz's work um, and to ensure the long-term relevance of his work by maintaining that integrity. So 
Um, we work with a licensing office in New York, but our office is tasked with making sure things are on model, that the editorial sounds like Schultz. Um, you know, over the years, I've been doing it for 23 years, and over the years there have been uh, pressures to modernize, to, you know, sort of whitewash peanuts, to sort of, you know, because Lucy punches people, you know, kids call each other names, they're not always nice to each other, you know, there's all that kind of stuff that happens in peanuts. Um, but it's part of that realness of peanuts that makes it, I think, continue to resonate um, because it taps into sort of our, all of our experiences of growing up and learning to be human and learning to get along with other people. Um, but it's funny, we had a, here's an example that just happened. We, uh, we, re, we are re-releasing some of the classic specials in book form and we just did the Easter Beagle. We did a, a abbreviated version of it for young first time readers. And Jeannie Schultz received a letter at the Schultz Museum from a guy who was very upset that, that there weren't crosses on the eggs and that we didn't talk about the true meaning of Easter. And, um, and he sent the book back and said he was really sorry he'd purchased it. And so then I have to write a letter to this guy because he wrote it to Jeannie, right? So I was like, okay, I'll write this guy a letter back. So I said to him, you know, the Christmas special, Linus does have his big speech about the true meaning of Christmas and that, that sort of canon to Peanuts. But the Easter Beagle is more of a, comment, a commentary about commercialism and it was never intended to talk about the true meaning of Christmas. I mean, true meaning of Easter. And had we changed the content of that special, we would have deviated from Sparky's original creative intent, right? So that's a recent example of that. Yes? Hey, uh, speaking of specials and such, was Sparky involved in selecting who voiced the characters? The question is, was Sparky involved in who voiced the characters? Yeah, I don't know that. I, I, I often think that Lee and Bill were more involved in that and that you know they got kids that they knew um, down in Southern California to voice the characters. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense that the younger generation, so kids that are growing up now, are familiar with these characters? And are, is it from the animation? I think that's why we wanted to do this new series on Apple TV Plus. And I know not everybody has access to that streaming service, but you know, kids, you have to meet kids where they are. So I think they're encountering characters more through animation than through reading a newspaper, obviously, or, you know, sometimes even books, but yeah. Any other questions? Yes, all the way in the back. Who's your favorite Peanuts character? Uh, Who's your favorite Peanuts character? Definitely Snoopy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you think about, um, you know, the thing that if Peanuts can be itself and, and in a platform that kids can, can encounter it, right? A lot of, a lot of uh, I find that a lot of cartoons for kids, the kids are very self-aware and they're not like, I don't know, they're almost too perfect. They seem too perfect in some ways. The Peanuts characters fully inhabit their issues. And I feel like as a kid, it's fun to, to see other kids have those same sort of issues of insecurity or, you know, I can't throw a football or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and it doesn't always end happily. No, no, you don't, always, you don't always win. Uh, the first one that you showed, I think, was so poignant, um, where he goes home and just looks at his little train, his tiny little train. By yeah. <laughs> uh, can you show the, the um, newspaper pages with the strip? Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to mention um, that these were discovered when we were cataloging our San Francisco Academy of Comic Art collection, uh, which is 75 tons of newsprint that we acquired um, in the late uh, 1990s from a man named Bill Blackbeard. If you were on the tour, you heard about this collection. Um, but when we were doing the centennial and, and we knew we were uh, gonna be um, doing some talks, we decided to see if we could find peanuts on a page with other strips. And sure enough, we were able to dig into many unprocessed, uncatalogued boxes of material to find this. And this is from the early 1950s. What is What year is that? Can you read that? Mm, I cannot. 50, 54, I think. Um, 
But it was really wonderful because we often see the strips now, you know, in book form or separately online, syndicated. Um, but to see them how they were on the page when they originally were um, uh, printed is, is really interesting. And if you go to the other one, um, Peanuts was originally sold as a space filler. And so the idea was that it was smaller than everything else and it was a different scale than everything else. Uh, and, and clearly he couldn't do the types of elaborate uh, you know, backgrounds and, and work. Um, but because of that, a lot of times when we, the, this strip was missing on the page. So if they had something else, they just didn't run the peanut strip in the early days. And so of course then it became so popular that everything changed. Um, but I thought that was that was kind of interesting. I'm so glad you, you have these in there. Yeah, I wasn't actually sure where they came from. Lex had them. Lex had yes. them for a talk he was doing, and I stole them because I was like, you really yeah. do need to see comics, newspaper comics on the page in the context that they ran. I mean, because then it's like a whole new, like, a uh, whole new lens. Yeah, and to see that, to see how tiny it ran, and then it starts to become clear why he, the economy of line. <laughs> I almost feel like he took that as a challenge. He's like, all right, I'm a space saver. All right. <laughs> like he just like made that his challenge, right? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of the things I noticed in the exhibit was Art Spiegelman's comic on Schultz, and where he's talking about Schultz's various imitators, and he's very critical of like Kathy and I think I can't remember the other, but saying that these are really lesser people who would uh, copy Schultz's style. And so I guess I wonder if you have any insight into what Schultz thought about. Oh yeah, can you summarize that? <laughs> Sorry. So the question was, um, in the exhibit, there's a, a tribute piece by Art Spiegelman that actually appeared in the New Yorker. And in it, Art is somewhat critical of, of what he calls Schultz's imitators, some of the other strips that, that came after him. And the question was, do you know anything about what he might have thought of um, some of these strips that might be considered imitating? work it's funny uh, one of the one of the first few weeks I was at the studio Sparky came he stuck his head in my office and he said hey there's this guy coming for lunch and I wondered if you wanted to join us and I was like yeah sure who is it and he said uh, this guy named Art Spiegelman <laughs> <laughs> and it was he had come to like talk to Sparky about contributing to some uh, I think what, what were those when they were they, little lit where they did like yes they did they got a cartoonist to retail classic stories anyway sparky ended up not doing it but um i do have some insider info about what sparky thought about other cartoonists because we would get these uh big these books from the syndicate that had all the week's comics right and on mondays we'd sit and have donuts bad donuts from the gas station and we'd talk about them and but i have to take that stuff to my grave <laughs> you can't give us anything? No. <laughs> I, I will say he was a great friend of Kathy, guys whites. <laughs> yes? So, you, did he interview you personally for the position? And if so, what, uh, what, what, what are your recollections from that early contact? He did not interview me. I, I met him the first time. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, did he personally interview uh, Paige for the position? And what was that like? Was that the second part? Or any recollections. Any recollections of what that was like? Yeah, no, he, there wasn't an interview. Um, the first time I met Sparky was at an NCS, National Cartoon Society meeting in Pasadena. And he and his wife, Jeannie, were playing baseball on the grass out behind the hotel because we all got there early. And I was walking around the building and this was like early, mid nineties. And I was like, I think that's Charles Schultz. <laughs> so I have my sketchbook under my arm and I sit on the steps and I'm watching him throw baseball. And like a minute, two minutes later, sprinklers come on in true Charlie Brown fashion. <laughs> and Jeannie left because Jeannie, if you know Jeannie, you know she can't sit still. Um, and Sparky came over and sat down wanted to look at my sketchbook. We started talking. We had a theological conversation because he was not one for small talk. Um, that was the first time I met him. And then I kept bumping into him. And then I was on a panel at a similar NCS event in Austin, Texas, no, San Antonio. And I was with some other female cartoonists, Jan Elliott, uh, Hillary Price. 
I, I think I was out in the hallway, like running my mouth. I forgot I was on the panel. Hillary's like, dude, are we doing this or what? And I, I was like, oh yeah. So I get in there. And then I was on some big high horse about, you know, uh, people selling out and trying to create things just to fill a hole or chase a dollar instead of finding their authentic voice, you know, regardless of income or whatever. I said all this stuff. I even got into an argument with his editor, Sarah Gillespie, who was in the audience, a little back and forth. Anyway, I'm thinking that was terrible, right? So I go off the stage and Schultz and Jeannie, Sparky and Jeannie were sitting in the second row and Sparky walked up and he said, hey, do you want a job? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, yeah. And he said, I, I don't really know. I don't really know what it is. And I was like, I don't care. I mean, literally, I would have mowed the grass, you know. Anyway, that's how it happened. So then I went to California. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone getting a job just being on a panel in that way. <laughs> That's extraordinary. Was there somebody else over here? Yes. You were saying when you started working at the studio how quiet it was compared to other studios you worked at. Did he have, when he was working, did he have any music on? Did he, or was it just a quiet setting? Did he, or did he listen to anything? The question was at the studio, Paige mentioned that it was very quiet when she first came there. Um, and the question is, uh, was there any music on? Did he listen to anything while he was working? I think when sometimes I get the impression he would close his door and go in there and work, but I got the impression if he like sort of wasn't coming up with anything, he would take a break, listen to some music. He had a TV in his office, like right next to his desk, like watch the news, whatever. Um, but I don't think he actually watched or listened to stuff while he was inking. What was interesting to me about him is, uh, this was just a fun fact, is he had this desk beside his drawing table and he would ink his all his dailies and he would just lay them out on the desk and he wouldn't date them until he was ready to mail them all in, like until Friday when he did the last strip. And I was always like, wow, he doesn't even know what order he's doing these in. He's just like, this is just like free form, right? I mean, I thought that was really kind of interesting. I don't know. You always think the masters have this great plan, but I think of so much of what he did was just intuitive, kind of from his heart. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, did you share any um, conversations with um, with Schultz regarding um, Bill Watterson and Calvin Hobbes, um, particularly like their uh, uh, how Peanuts and Calvin Hobbes were both really genuine, great examples of like human condition. Uh, do you have any conversations like that with Schultz regarding The question is, is if Paige had any conversations with Charles Schultz about Bill Watterson sure. and that both strips were about um, the human condition and, and I'm going to put words in your mouth. That's Very fine. authentic voice. <laughs> Not really. I mean, it's always interesting to me because Bill Watterson, the the two of them, I never did ask Sparky about, but they obviously had very different feelings about the sort of commercialism of comic art, right? Because Sparky was kind of like, sure, all in. Bill was like, never, you know what I mean? So, and yet even though Sparky did that sort of all in on licensing, he, he's, I think he did it because he carved out the space that was the comic strip as solely his, only his voice, only his viewpoint. You know, this other stuff, this other noise could happen on its own and not affect what he was doing um, at the drawing board, so. Any other questions? Yes, here. Um, so earlier you said that you couldn't tell us about some of the, his thoughts about those strips, maybe that he didn't like. Were there any that he did like at that time? The question is, you couldn't tell us about um, <laughs> the, the strips <laughs> that came after him, uh, maybe the, particularly the ones he didn't like. Can you tell us if there were any that he particularly did like? Well, he loved Patrick McDonald's comic, Mutz. Um, he loved the drawing style and just the sentiment behind it. I mean, when we would talk about comic, the funny thing about him was, I mean, he, his drawings are very simple, but, but Schultz was a great draftsman, right? So when he looked at a comic, he'd be like, ah, oh, so-and-so, they can't draw any, anybody except in profile. Can they draw like, can't even draw the back of somebody's head? Like he would just make comments like that that I thought were really funny. Um, <laughs> without calling anybody out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Since it was such a small studio, I mean, maybe it was a studio time, but did he ever, did you say he didn't plan daily, even, he wasn't sure even what the order would be, right? But were there ever brainstorming sessions with anyone else asking what he would be producing? Or 
members of all the unit. So the question is, uh, were there ever brainstorming sessions with anyone else? Did he ever talk to anyone else about his ideas or have brainstorming sessions with others? Or was he requesting? Right, were, there, were sorry, were, was he requesting? Maybe, maybe requests, either on certain subjects, on was he requested to speak on certain subjects? He, he like definitely didn't, I mean, you know, like everybody who creates from life, a conversation happens and somebody says something funny and you kind of take it, you kind of use it, right? Because that's what makes good dialogue is that authenticity. I don't think he would ever sort of take an idea for someone or share an idea. Funny, funny thing was I had, I had just been doing James World for maybe a year or two, maybe two years when I started working there and I had, it hadn't quite turned into what it ended up becoming. And he came in one day and he said, you know, if you do this and this and this, that'd be a lot better. And I go, oh, yeah, you know, you're right. And then he looked at me and he said, but I don't want any advice. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on a panel um, recently at the National Cartoonist Society with Jean Schultz, and she mentioned that she had given him one idea, which uh, he did not take. And so she gave it to his friend, Maury Turner, who did a comic strip called Lee Pals, <laughs> and he used it. <laughs> but I don't remember what the idea was. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Um, Peanuts as a comic has always been very character-centric and very standalone. Um, has there ever been like points brought up as to why Peanuts never seemed to cover current events of the times of the decades that it's been it published? So Peanuts was very character driven, and uh, was there, sorry, say no, the no, second no. part again. Uh, um, has there ever been any discussion on why Peanuts hasn't been, uh, hasn't been influenced by like current events? Has there ever been any discussion about why he didn't let current events yes. influence the strip and write a lot about current events? Yeah, he was very particular about the idea that his comic strip should not be political. and. You know, a lot of people try to make it things that it's not. Um, like I always, like, you know, because he did use sort of classic stories from the Bible. But if you think about the way he used those stories, they're not, he's not promoting Christianity in an evangelical way. He's like drawing on these like epic stories from our collective history or whatever, right? Um, and if you do read, reading the strip now, if I read the strips like from the 70s, it does feel like there's a little bit of social commentary in there, um, you know, during like the Vietnam era and like there's actually comics about vaccines. I mean, it's weird to read it now and think, whoa, that was about something totally different, but it's totally relevant right now. But I think definitely later, he just didn't want it to be political at all. So we really try to watch for that. Um, at the studio because during election years people try to use the characters to do things and instead of we so we try to get ahead of that and use the characters to say vote you know uh, let everyone hear your voice you know um, instead of like being on one side of the fence or the other okay yeah. Yeah, you said how he kept merchandising separate from the strip and you know that entity separate there was, I thought I remembered a case where like the little red haired girl, she was never shown in the strip, but she was shown in the cartoons. Like where did he, was there any pushback like what you don't show and what you show in the merchandising in that regard? Well, the question is about the uh, keeping the strip separate from the animation of the merchandising. Um, but although the little red haired girl never appeared in the strip, she did appear in the animation. And so was there any yeah, discussion there, about like, what you could be like what would he allow and what wouldn't he right what would he allow and what wouldn't he well if you watch some of the later specials you, it's obvious he was not as involved in some of those later specials when some things happened that maybe he shouldn't have i don't know i don't even i don't have a good answer for that we we try, the studio now tries to use the comic strip as sort of our Bible, our editorial Bible. And if it didn't happen on the strip, we try to keep it from happening. But like animation is sort of a different thing. Like the movie, I think in 2015 might've shown things that we wouldn't show in the comic strip or in licensed product. Yeah. 
Yeah, so. Okay, we have time for one more. What are you reading? The question is, what are you reading? Oh, wow. You know, I'm one of those people that uh, when somebody asks me what I'm reading, I suddenly have book blindness, and I can't. I have like eight books on my nightstand, but I can't remember. Uh, I actually picked up Tom Gold's uh, Goliath to read before I came because it's one of my favorites. Uh, and then I'm reading a book about belonging in the Celtic tradition by John O'Donohue. Those are the two things I'm reading right now. It's kind of a feel-good book. So if I can just uh, use this opportunity to say, I'm sure all of you saw in the news that there are new peanut stamps. Yes. Uh, USPS stamps that have just been released. So be sure you get to your um, post office and purchase the new peanut stamps. And that was just like last week, wasn't it? It was Friday, yeah. On Friday. Yeah, okay. October's a crazy month for peanuts. <laughs> and the other thing is there's a wonderful book, and I actually have a copy in my office, and I, I wish I had thought to bring it. Um, it was just published, which is uh, looking at Schultz's life and career through 100 objects. Yeah, the museum did that. Yeah, and it's a really amazing book. So um, check that one out. I, I highly recommend it. I, I got about a quarter of the way through it. It's fascinating. And they talked to different people in his life, different cartoonists who chose objects and why they thought that, that was particularly important to them. Um, so it's a really interesting way to, to look at his life and, and his legacy. Uh, so I definitely recommend that. So with that, let's say thank you to Paige.